Welcome back, everyone. This segment is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Learn more at Tenable.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with now some additional hosts on the show. Of course, Mr. Larry Pesce is here with us. Welcome, Yay. Larry. Okay. Uh, also here in studio, joining uh, uh, from Tenable Network Security, one of my fellow co-workers, Mr. Matt McClellan. Matt is actually the product manager for Nessus. So maybe later if we can get Matt to disclose his email address, you can send him <coughs> feature requests just like you sent to me today. Now you can just get them directly to Matt. It's beautiful. I'll tell you right now, P. Asadorian. Yes. Edible.com. <laughs> yes, that's Oh, they're, they're well aware of that one. <laughs> you know how my feature requests get in? I have this little thing the, down here called Instant, instant Messenger. messenger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, <laughs> can you add this? On the lines via Skype, Mr. Carlos Perez is here with us. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. And Knott Kevins joins us from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. How's it going? Good, good, good. Uh, I'd like to introduce our very special guest interview for tonight's show, Mr. Steve Crocker, who's the CEO and founder of Shinkuro Incorporated and chair of the ICANN Board of Directors. Dr. Crocker has been involved in the Internet since its inception in the late 60s and early 70s while he was a graduate student at UCLA. He was part of the team that developed the protocols for ARPANET, laying the foundation for today's Internet. Um, uh, he initiated the request for comment series and is author of RFC1, which we have an interesting story about how that unfolded. Um, Dr. Crocker's honors include a 2002 IEEE Internet Award and an honorary doctorate from the University of San Martin de Porres in Lima, Peru, and membership in the Internet Hall of Fame in 2012. Steve, welcome to the Security Weekly Show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Yes, it's nice to have you. I wanted to start by uh, recapping the creation of RFC1. There seems to be um, a little bit of uh, misunderstanding about some of the details on how RFC1 was in fact created. So if you could take us through that, we'd be, we'd be honored. Thank you very much. So uh, I got to set the stage a little bit. Um, there had been experiments in networking in the, throughout the 1960s. Uh, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which at the time uh, was called just the Advanced Research Projects Agency without the word defense in front of it, it was the same agency. Uh, initiated a project to connect up uh, the research laboratories that it was already supporting research at. So you had a situation where there was a substantial amount of uh, state-of-the-art research in a variety of topics, artificial intelligence, new advanced architectures, graphics, uh, programming languages, a whole series of, of what was then cutting-edge uh, research at laboratories around the United States, uh, principally in universities, at Carnegie Mellon University, at MIT, at, at Berkeley, and, and so forth, but also at some of the uh, uh, companies that were also doing research. And in that environment, where they were already paying for the research, they said, we're going to make a big leap forward in the idea of connecting computers together, and we're going to do that with a project that we're going to pay for that is going to put... Um, a node at every one of these sites. Um, today, you would say you put a router there, but the word router hadn't been adopted as the <laughs> term of art. Wow. And, and so that was what the ARPANET project was about. Um, they started the project uh, choosing four sites in the western part of the United States, UCLA, University of California, Santa Barbara, SRI in Menlo Park, and the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Uh, and they formally contracted with Bolt, Brannock and Newman in Cambridge to design the, uh, the boxes that uh, they were called IMPs for interface message processors, but they, uh, they, they served the role of today you would call it a router. Mm -hmm. Now, there wasn't any standards for that. There wasn't any technology. And so part of what had to be done was to develop that from scratch. BBN used a Honeywell 516 computer as its base made some uh, uh, specific changes to the hardware, built the software from scratch, designed what the, uh, uh, what the approach was going to be, and delivered those boxes on a uh, pre-agreed schedule 
to these four sites. That was the formal work that was contracted. That was all done under the usual. Uh, there was a request for comment and a competitive bid and so forth. What was not done formally was to figure out exactly what to do with this network. Uh, <laughs> it was a field of dreams kind of approach. Uh, there was quite a lot of understanding about all the things that could be done, but the details of working that out was not done in the usual uh, Department of Defense top-down, here's, here's our plan and you guys go execute it and then we'll take lowest bid. Rather, they put these imps at each of the sites and invited the uh, people at these research sites to figure out what was going to happen. Now, each of these research sites was being run by a professor or a comparable person, a principal investigator, who already had a very strong research agenda. So this gift, if you will, that was being imposed on them um, was handed down to the next layer. Mm -hmm. So you guys take care of this, so to speak. And so at the universities, this meant uh, graduate students were engaged in um, trying to figure out what to do with this, this network. So we had a, a ground uh, uh, operation, a, a sort of a bottoms-up approach, if you will, of representatives from these first four sites, and then it grew to be others as the network grew, coming together and saying, okay, what shall we do with this? And uh, there wasn't any competition because we were all being supported out of the same office. Mm -hmm. uh, and there wasn't any constraints on it. It was try to do the right thing. Uh, we could see easily that we'd obviously want to be able to log in to remote computers as if we had dialed them up. These were time-sharing computers of the day, mm -hmm. um, typically. And we could also see that we'd like to be able to move a file from one place to another. But those were uh, the, the, the lowest hanging fruit and not the totality of what needed to be done. We could also see that we couldn't see everything that we might imagine. Uh, we could imagine some things, but there'd be other things coming along later. So what emerged out of that was a series of conversations by representatives from these, as uh, started with first four sites and then, and then expanded, uh, kind of a blue sky. What will we do with this network? And this conversation started even before the specification of what the connection was between our host computers and these imps that were being delivered. We didn't have... <laughs> there was no uh, protocol. Was there a protocol to have, talk? Didn't have the interface spec mm -hmm. because they hadn't been built yet. We knew the rough spec. We knew it was going to be 50,000 bit per second lines between uh, over long distance that was going to be the connection. We knew that it was going to be packet switched, um, but that was kind of the extent of it. So we sat around intermittently uh, for several months, starting in August 1968 and continuing, you know, every four to six weeks we'd go and meet somewhere. Uh, and then uh, uh, after a few months of this, in the spring of 69, uh, uh, I think it was a meeting in March, we decided that it was time to start writing down what our thoughts were. And we dealt out assignments to ourselves that so you've been working on this idea you take that mm -hmm. I'll take this and so forth and then I took on the additional task I took one of those and then I took on an additional task of trying to organize the notes and uh, uh, it was a little bit of trepidation because I was fearful that as we wrote these notes that we might trigger uh, some response from somebody from some authority after all we were we weren't children, but we weren't very old. We were in our 20s typically, and we, were, uh, we didn't have any formal charter. We didn't have any, uh, nobody had said, you guys are in charge. Um, so I was, I was quite nervous that somebody would show up uh, principally from the east, either from Washington or Boston, I wasn't sure which, and say, uh, what are you guys doing, and who put you in charge, and so forth. And I hit on this device of calling every one of these notes as a matter of form, a request for comments to set the tone that this was a, a part of a dialogue as opposed to an authoritarian type statement or an huh. assertion. That's very interesting. And, 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 that, and, and the notes were completely open. There were no restrictions. You could write anything. Anybody could get them. They were distributed free of charge. It had absolutely nothing to do with tension with, with uh, masters in the Defense Department. Uh, they were 100% supportive and thrilled with the approach that we took. Uh, so the, the idea that was uh, floated in the uh, previous podcast about um, this was a, a kind of a, a rebellious activity is just completely off the mark. Um, and, uh, and, and I thought the notes would be of temporary, uh, last for a few months until we had a formal, until the network was built, we had some formal documentation. So it was, it's, it's 
a bit of surprise, uh, uh, kind of a large surprise, that that took root, flowered, and became the mechanism by which uh, uh, specifications for mm -hmm. networking have been developed over the years. Now, in the early days, we didn't have the network, so these were mailed uh, on paper <laughs> to everybody. And part of one of the things that we wrote down was what the mailing addresses were for everybody. And when we added somebody to the mailing list, we sent out another one of these. So the early RFCs included mailing lists. And I have, if you count up the number of uh, RFCs attributed to me, some good number of them are updates to the mailing list. So those have the zero value from a technical uh, contribution. <laughs> Quite obviously with email, we now don't have to do that anymore. Further, an awful lot of the technical development is done via email and is done with a secondary level of document called internet drafts. So these days, requests for comments are considerably more formal mm -hmm. uh, by the time they get to that state. And in fact, in the, uh, in the irony that was developed so nicely in uh, uh, the novel 1984, uh, requests for comments aren't actually requests for comments in any uh, reasonable <laughs> sense anymore. So George Orwell, got it right and as we as we passed through that it uh it changed but uh, that's the story um, now i heard rfc one did you write that on the on the toilet is that in the bathroom <laughs> is that is that the that's the story i heard i don't know you need to clear well, the air on that I, I, so to speak. I, I was it wasn't on the toilet um the um <laughs> thankfully as i said i was i was feeling some trepidation and i had uh I had committed to writing both what turned out to be RFC 1, which is a technical note, and a, another note, which turned out to be RFC 3, which were the rules for the RFCs, uh, kind of an administrative note. And uh, I took several cracks at it over a couple of week period, and I kept stalling. I was, I was uh, because as I said, I was worried about what the impact was going to be. At that time, I was staying with some friends. It wasn't my family, but I was staying with, uh, with another family. And uh, it was a multi-generational family with people sleeping in all different parts of the house. And I uh, was awake at like 3 a.m. and I was determined to get this out. And the only place that I could find where I wouldn't disturb anybody mm -hmm. was in the bathroom. So I wrote what turned out to be RFC 3 standing up in the bathroom. I wasn't on the toilet, actually. I was <laughs> uh, but I, I was, I was uh, erect uh, and... Uh, uh, working at the sink, which was, and there was light and uh, there was a, a surface there and I could scribble. The first standing uh, desks, as it were. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's what it was. And, um, uh, you know, it was one of those, uh, you know, just like today, you, you get an idea in your mind and you can't go to sleep and you work on it and uh, it doesn't matter whether it's day or night. And it was just a happenstance that uh, uh, that was the circumstance that was in. At, at that time, Steve, were people thinking about global connectivity? Like, when did people first start talking about uh, it growing beyond just connecting a few different locations and saying, well, what if this goes yeah. global? Yeah. So uh, I get asked questions of that form in various ways. Uh, usually they're uh, phrased a little differently. Uh, uh, could you, did you, uh, how much of what we have today did you anticipate or did you see? Mm -hmm. And I usually say, well, everything is proceeding exactly on schedule. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but let me give you, let me give you a, a, a more um, uh, substantive answer and, and uh, less, less of a joke. Uh, as, I, as I indicated, this, this network was built in a research environment where the, the individual nodes, the individual places, were where the cutting edge of research in computer science was taking place already. So we had a remarkable advantage of being able to see into the future because, um, mm. you know, without, without overstating it, we were the future. Uh, the second site at SRI was the laboratory that Doug Engelbart was running. He had already invented the mouse. He already had uh, interactive computing with hyperlinks and uh, graphics and, uh, uh, you know, a good a good version of what we all have today mm -hmm. running and being used in his laboratory. And he had done a major was he demonstration. At, was he at Menlo, Menlo Park? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Menlo Park, for, for, for your listeners, is uh, the next town up from Palo Alto where Stanford is. 
Uh, SRI is a is not was part of Stanford or a spinoff of Stanford, but it's a research organization that isn't part of the university. Originally stood for Stanford Research Institute, and over the years it got more and more distinct, and now it's just called SRI International. And they do an awful lot of work for the government, and they do work on a lot of different uh, projects. But in particular, they had uh, two, actually, two laboratories in computer science that were being supported by this one office within ARPA, one focused on um, what he called augmentation of human intellect, which was really interactive computing. And so the other was an artificial intelligence laboratory. Um, a few years later, I was working at ARPA, and I was the program manager funding uh, research at these places. And so I got to see the same work from the other side of the, of the fence, as it were. But uh, uh, Engelbart had um, all this stuff working, and we could see that that would be the future, and it was only a question of waiting for it to get uh, commercialized. So, mm -hmm. so it took a few decades and uh, went through Xerox Park, and then came out through Apple. Um, but the the, uh, the 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 genealogy of all that is very easy to trace, uh, both in terms of the technology and the people that are involved. So, so we could see all that. So the the shorter answer to your question is, yes, uh, it was quite obvious, at least to me, and I think to everybody, that. In relatively short order, every computer would want to be connected to a network. Now, for me, I wasn't watching the impact of Moore's Law quite so closely. So computers of the day were relatively big. They were business-sized. You know, they took up a room. Mm. Uh, businesses owned computers. Universities owned computers. Government owned computers. Um, they didn't fit in your pocket, and, they didn't, and you didn't have them at home, and your, and your grandmother had no idea what they were. Uh, so it, it was different from today's environment, but it was quite clear that uh, an unconnected computer would be uh, uh, very weak. I mean, I, I didn't want to be carrying tapes or moving cards around anymore. I just wanted to be able to hit a few buttons, then a file would move, uh, and, and that that would be the norm. So we could see that pretty clearly, yes. Hmm. Um, what else could we see? Uh, quite a few things. I'll tell you what I didn't see. Uh, I didn't anticipate Google quite the way it turned out. I didn't anticipate mm. Facebook, and I'm still not sure what it is or why people use it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're still trying to figure that out ourselves. We're right, I, we're right I did, there with you. I, I did anticipate electronic commerce, mm -hmm. uh, and we actually put some projects together um, early in, in the days of, aimed at that. We did actually see uh, packetized speech. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the earliest experiments on the ARPANET, right within the first couple of years, were experiments at packetizing speech and, uh, speech and uh, sending uh, condensed uh, speech over the network, and with quite good results. Hmm. Um, what we didn't anticipate was that uh, it would be Estonia that would be the source of uh, most of our voice uh, over uh, mm -hmm. the Internet these days. Huh. Um, Steve, which, uh, well, actually I want to start with, and I always heard that, in the beginning of the internet, right, it was those universities that were connected to each other. And as you already alluded to, there was a certain level of trust. So when you were developing protocols early on, security didn't really factor in because there was already a built-in level of trust. Is that, is that in fact true? Well, that's partly true. Um, and it's certainly the case that security has turned out to be uh, one hell of a problem. Mm. Uh, uh, <clears throat> There are some useful things to say about the environment at the time. So we're going back into the 1970s. Uh, uh, public key encryption uh, had not yet appeared. Mm -hmm. uh, we know now that uh, the British actually had invented this and kept it quiet, or uh, maybe they shared it with NSA, but it, it was not evident anywhere. And it wasn't until... Uh, uh, Whit Diffie and, and uh, Hellman and others uh, worked on the idea, and then Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman put the RSA um, algorithms together that the idea of using asymmetric encryption um, and, and public keys uh, became possible. And so that was in the future. So the only, the only encryption that was available, if you will, was uh, using uh, the data encryption standard, and that still meant that you had to figure a way to get keys moved around. Right. So that was, that was certainly one major impediment. Another uh, is that uh, computing power was on the weak side, and uh, there was considerable concern about the cost, uh, the computing cost of doing this. There was um, 
a very strong uh, resistance emanating from NSA, uh, who in those days tried very hard to control the uh, public work on, on cryptography. Hmm. Uh, and so there was another uh, pattern of resistance. But I would say on top of all that, uh, we kind of missed uh, an understanding of how big the problem was going to be. The time-sharing systems that we connected typically had, say, 30 people or 100 people who were the users of these, and they were all known. You had to get an account, and you had to be part of some organization right. or whatever. So uh, it wasn't that we'd never seen bad behavior before. Mm -hmm. uh, bad behavior shows up in any collection of human beings uh, mm -hmm. almost anywhere. But uh, the, uh, um, the responses to it were to go get hold of the kid and explain to him uh, what the facts of life were. And if he, uh, <laughs> if he, didn't, if he didn't get it, then you kind of extricate him and, and kick him off and you, you remove him. Uh, different approaches were tried at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT, for example. Uh, they added an instruction to the operating system that allowed you in a single instruction to kill anybody else's proce process, uh, thereby taking all the fun out of figuring out how to break the operating system. Uh, <laughs> so that, works, that works fine in that environment and, you know, it's sort of tongue-in-cheek, but uh, doesn't scale up. Now, you know, you take those same systems and you scale them up so that a 14-year-old uh, a in Amsterdam or Manila on a Saturday morning can go uh, attack somebody. And the dynamics are just completely different. They don't scale from the quality. Of so we had, just to do a quick recap, we had passwords in the clear. We mm -hmm. had uh, uh, no, uh, no public key encryption. We had uh, a very strong resistance from part of the government about doing much work in this area. And so in adapting the security methods that we had for our time-sharing systems, which just included uh, you know, regular login ID and password, and trying to scale that up across this network, uh, we got the, some of the ills that we have today. A whole different set of things is the bugs that appear in software. I can go on for a long time about that. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm quite entered. Um, exercised about where we stand in that, but that's a, a, a different broadcast. So, Steve, um, I want to ask you about a fact in history, and if you remember giving Vint Cerf a boost up to a window on the second floor of UCLA's computer lab to access the locked facility as a young high school student in 1960. Well, that you've got exactly right. <laughs> uh, you got something right. First yeah. time for everything. <laughs> so, so the uh, the context was this. Um, so I I I was keen to uh, hang around computing centers, and um, uh, back in those days, as I said, uh, the, the the way you got to a computer was at a university or at a business. They were they didn't exist in high schools or at home or so forth. So I. Uh, I started to hang out at UCLA, and I was treated actually quite well. And I was given access to uh, a, uh, a Bendix G15, which you could have to look up in your history books. It's uh, about the size of a Coke machine or a refrigerator. Uh, its storage consisted of a rotating drum. And it had about 8,000 words, if I recall, something like that, and, uh, and, and a terminal that you sit in front of. And people would sign up for hours of time or half-hour slots of time. Uh, it was a one-person-at-a-time machine as opposed to a time-sharing system. And uh, I was uh, a math geek, and I was playing around with some funny equations. And Vint and I were good friends, and he was also uh, into math. And so I, I said uh, one Saturday, I said, let's go work on the computer all day. Uh, nobody will be using it, and we can uh, do some experiments with these equations. So we drove from Van Nuys, where we lived, uh, in the San Fernando Valley on the north side of Los Angeles, over the hill, over the Santa Monica Mountains. We get to UCLA, and the building is locked. And I'm uh, crestfallen, because uh, that's completely destroyed my plan. If Once we get in the building, no problem. All the doors were open. This was long before all of the anti-war demonstrations and all of the mm -hmm. things that followed. So uh, life was a lot easier in those days. Vint looks up and sees that the casement window, this is a window that you, you turn a crank yeah. and the, it opened, that it was open. 
and I'm uh, looking at him and, and, and thinking, we're not really going to do this, are we? And uh, the next thing I know, Vince on my shoulders, <laughs> climbing, climbing through the window. This gets better. It, it's, it gets much better. He climbs through the window. He comes around to the uh, main door of the building, which is you know a few feet away, and pushes the bar and opens it up, and we go in. And then we tape the door so that we can get in and out and go to the cafeteria and get some food and so forth during the day. And we spend the day doing our business in the, in the laboratory. <clears throat> Nobody bothers us, and we clean up afterwards. So that's 1960. Uh, Eleven years later, uh, I'm now working for the uh, U.S. Defense Department, carrying a top-secret clearance. Uh, and um, the Watergate burglars break in to uh, to, to, to the Democratic uh, headquarters in in the Watergate complex in Washington, and there's a guy across the street looking out for them in what was then a Howard Johnson's motel, and these guys had taped the uh, door in the same way that I had taped the door so they could get in and out, and a plainclothes guard had found that. And because he was in plain clothes, the uh, lookout guy across the street uh, didn't understand what the uh, imminent threat was. And that guard called for reinforcements, and they arrested the burglars, and the rest of them, you know, and, and, and after a while, Nixon had to resign. So uh, it was really, really big stuff. When it was reported that these guys were caught because they, they had taped the door, the shiver that went down my spine was something <laughs> awful. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, which of the protocols uh, have you worked on in terms of the RFCs for some of the Internet standards, Steve? Well, um, so there were two periods, really, um, uh, then and now, so to speak. Uh, so in the early days, uh, I spent a lot of time trying to f figure out, along with others, what the structure of the protocols ought to be and what the, uh, what the mainstay protocols were. I put a lot of effort into what we initially called the host-to-host -host protocol, and later through um, sort of a natural evolution language became the network control protocol. It was um, a base level protocol that was eventually replaced by TCP. Mm -hmm. uh, so its role was to provide the appearance or the abstraction of a stream of bits being sent continuously from one place to another. Uh, and then, of course, the way it was actually implemented was it was broken up into messages that were sent and acknowledged and so forth. And there were issues of flow control, so you don't overrun and you could control it at mm -hmm. various points. So those basic elements were in uh, what today would be called the network control protocol. Um, when, uh, so that was a major thing I worked on. I worked to some extent on Telnet and FTP, which are still used today for... Uh, uh, simulating a dial-up terminal and simulating or, or implementing file transfer protocol. Uh, but uh, more broadly, I was concerned with the broad architecture that you slice things into thin layers and you can build on top of them and, and you could manage that process in a way that didn't foreclose future possibilities. Um, when uh, the ARPANET started to be connected with other networks and we had the, the Internet, um, Two things happened. One was there needed to be a, a layer of protocol below that host-to-host -host, uh, protocol so that you could move packets across networks. Mm -hmm. And that's what the IP layer is. And the other was that there was now quite a bit of experience with, uh, with the network control protocol and some things that needed to be fixed. Um, some were, were, I would say, errors in design. And the other is that there had been... Um, some interesting improvements in the culture. Uh, when we started to connect computers together, the size of a character, number of bits in a character, was not common across the, across the world. You had many machines that used six-bit characters, some that used seven, some that used eight, some that used nine bits. Um, and the character set was not ASCII all the time. In fact, the dominant one was the IBM uh, encoding mm -hmm. of Epstedek. Mm -hmm. So um, by the time uh, over the next several years, 8-bit bytes became standardized. Architectures tended to evolve toward 8-bit uh, multiples, and 8-bits uh, became a unit of transmission. So if you look at the details of the network control protocol, uh, the units by which we measured transmission and counted it was actually in single bits. And when uh, it shifted to TCP, the unit was very naturally in 8-bit increments. But there were other changes as well. 
So I worked on all of that. I had viewed my involvement in networking as a distraction from what my original agenda for in life was going to be, which had to do with formal methods and uh, artificial intelligence and some topics like that. So I made a uh, an exit from networking after a few years and went back to focus on that and did so for several years. And then gradually, in a sequence of moves that are not too interesting and I, I won't bore everybody with, I got back into networking uh, bit by bit and, uh, and with heavy emphasis on security. So in the more recent years, uh, and more recent includes, um, I guess, more than 20 years now, maybe maybe 25 or so, even more than that, wow. Um, Mm -hmm. I've worked on uh, privacy enhanced mail. I've worked on uh, DNS security extensions and uh, related kinds of things over time. Mm -hmm. Steve, over over time, has how was the term hacker or like when did that first come about and, and how is that meeting, like what has it meant to you being there some of the early days when the Internet was being created? Well, before the Internet, um, I, I, I spent a year and a half as a graduate student at MIT. And uh, I got when I when I arrived at MIT, I was fortunate enough to to be in the artificial intelligence lab, which, besides doing research in artificial intelligence, had um, one of the strongest group of um, programmers who just had a phenomenal ability to build software, operating systems, and assemblers, and compilers, and editors, and all sorts of stuff. And they prided themselves on the quality of their programming and. In that environment, and I don't know the full origins of this, but in that environment, a hack was a cool thing, was, mm. a, was a, a, a piece of cleverness. It was a positive connotation, not a negative one. And a hacker was somebody who could pull off these very cute, uh, uh, somewhat intricate pieces of programming to the amazement and uh, uh, affirmation of, of peers. Uh, somewhere along the way, hacking turned into a negative thing of breaking into computers and so forth. And that happened later. So there was quite a, quite a transformation. Mm. I think if you look in the literature, you'll see both, both terms used. Um, but the negative connotation, which is, which is the common one today, uh, rose after people started breaking into computers on a wholesale basis. Mm -hmm. Steve, when did the transition to IANA and how did IANA get created and, and what role does it play? I think people you know, know what IANA is, but may not know how it came to be and, and what role it plays today. So uh, let me take you back to the origin of the RFCs as long as we've talked about it. Um, I said I had taken on the uh, uh, clerical task of organizing the uh, request for comment series and uh, I made one rule which was that uh, each of these had to have a number and that I would hand out the number but you had to write the thing first because I, I was trying to avoid having big uh, holes in the series where somebody would say a number and then they would never finish writing it. Right. So, uh, so I handed out these numbers for a couple of years uh, and then I left UCLA um, took a leave of absence, basically, to go work at ARPA in Washington, and uh, later came back after a few years and finally finished my dissertation. But uh, as I left, I uh, turned over my shoulder to John Postel, who was another grad student in the group, and asked him if he would take on the task of handing out these numbers. Uh, and that's really all it was. It was really a very minor uh, piece of ministrivia. Uh, over time, other clerical tasks needed to be done, uh, mm -hmm. other things to be kept track of. Um, and uh, everybody said, well, John's doing a good job of this. Give it to him. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, truly, it was, uh, you let John do it. And John was uh, rather amazingly well-suited to this in that he had a very strong technical background. He also had uh, two pieces of personality that were a good fit. One was that he uh, was quite well-organized and... Um, uh, uh, was able to do this without screwing it up. And the other is that he did not have an ego that required that he be in front of the camera or in charge or uh, uh, dominating everything. So he, he didn't challenge anybody else. He wasn't in competition with everybody. And yet he was fully smart enough and, and doing a quality research work of his own so that he was accepted into the inner, inner circle. So over time, there was this... Uh, Slowly, almost like uh, boiling a frog, where you do it slowly and the frog never notices. Uh, he, he accumulated more and more of these clerical tasks. And 
Then finally, it became clear that uh, this was a full-scale operation, mm -hmm. and he was designated as the, um, as the numbers czar, as it were. And uh, the term IANA was created as uh, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Uh, but it was a, uh, just a, a very natural progression of let John do it. Uh, and then um, one of the things that happened on John's watch was as we expanded the network, we started by just numbers on the different sites. So UCLA was one, and if you wanted to connect up to UCLA, you'd type, on a, you'd type connect one, and uh, a connection would be about, and for SRI, it was two, and so you'd type connect two. Well, very rapidly, we, we decided it'd be handy to have uh, acronyms. So we uh, made tables, and we said UCLA equal one, SRI equal two, and so forth. And that table, uh, so-called host table, uh, was distributed around as we'd add more. And well, eventually, that host table got to be longer and longer and longer, and the distribution process was messy, and the maintenance process was messy. And uh, uh, John and uh, a, uh, a guy named Paul Macapetris, who had come to work for us at, at ISI, uh, sat down and worked out this hierarchical system with distributed administration, which is the domain name system. And all of a sudden, we had a, uh, a rather uh, fully fleshed out uh, system. And it required a little bit of administration at the very top level. At the same time, the, uh, this internet started to grow internationally. Uh, there were connections to other countries through various means, cooperative research agreements and so forth. And uh, uh, John uh, navigated a way of finding pioneers in each of the countries and using, and, and he also navigated a, a method of choosing what the name was going to be by saying, rather than get into a messy business of us making a decision and getting all kinds of contention, we'll use a pre-existing system that the UN already has um, for two-letter country codes. And so we adopted the two-letter country codes that come out of the uh, uh, UN uh, mm -hmm. maintenance agency, 3166. Uh, so that's U.S. for the United States, but it's C.H. for uh, Switzerland, for example, and uh, Z.A. for South, South Africa. Um, and then he'd find somebody in, in each of these countries, uh, or when he, I should say, I don't know how aggressively he looked, but whenever he found somebody, he would say, okay, you now run the top-level domain for that country. So I, there's a guy who just joined ICANN, Adil Ekplogan, and I was talking to him about his history. And he said he, he was in Togo and he started the first uh, ISP and he got to meet John and John said, okay, you are now in charge of .tg. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's the way things flourished in the early days and then uh, gradually things got bigger and bigger and, so and it, more organized. It was also John that had responsibility for distributing IP addresses and assignments. In, is that correct? Same, same issue is that... Um, you know, when IP addresses were created and somebody needed to keep track of it, let John do it. It's just a clerk. Let John fast. do it. Gotcha. <laughs> this is what happens when you're too good at your job. Yeah. What, it, do, did John ever notice early on and say, you know, we might run out of these someday? Like, when did that thought start to come into mind? Oh, so uh, uh, it was Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn who uh, made the decisions about 32 bits ought to be enough, uh, 4 billion mm. uh, addresses. My goodness, uh, how are we ever going to get there? Because the original addresses were 8 bits. Uh, and uh, it's a big step up from uh, 255 right. or 6 to uh, 4 billion. Uh, it was evident in the, I don't know precisely when, but let's say around 1990, give or take a few years, mm -hmm. that uh, things were getting out of hand. And the design process for the next stage of addressing started, and then there's a whole lot of history there mm. that has led to IPv6. Uh, but it was evident that there were problems. There were graphs showing the usage uh, and the consumption. Uh, the original use of that 32 bits was divided up into uh, so-called classes. Uh, there were uh, 32-bit address was divided up into a left part, which is the network, and a right part, which was a host. And uh, the division, where that division point was, had three possibilities. The uh, one possibility was eight bits of address of, of network address, and then 32, uh, 24 bits, sorry, of uh, host address. Another was sixteen and sixteen, and the third was twenty-four bits of uh, network address and only eight bits of network of, of host address. Sorry. Um, 
as it turned out, the middle, the middle grouping, the so-called class B of 16 bits of network address and 16 bits of uh, host address, that class of uh, addresses got consumed faster than the others. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we could sort of see trouble coming. <clears throat> So one of the changes that took place was a way of having a more variable point of where that division took place, the so-called classless uh, addresses. And the other big change that took place was uh, having networks hidden behind other networks with uh, network mm. address translation NAT boxes. And that eventually led to the designation of um, uh, RC1918, where you have uh, both NET10 and 192.168 address for purely for local that would never be uh, emitted out onto the public net. And that extended the lifetime by quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And now we're still in trouble. I mean, we now, <laughs> we now come true. to a place where uh, there's quite a lot of pressure. So I, I've got a, an interesting question that uh, was actually submitted by Dan Gear. So I'm going to read it as it was submitted, and so it's up for you to interpret as you like. What is the implication to ICANN of a fully geolocated internet? So I don't actually know what that means exactly. What, what does geolocated internet mean? I'm not sure. It's not a term that I use. Uh, uh, I'm not trying to be resistant here. I'm just uh, trying to be helpful. Uh, uh, I can think of a couple different things that Dan might be meaning. I've sure. never had that conversation with him. Um, there certainly are some efforts at uh, content-oriented uh, addressing or content addressing. So instead of sending things to a particular address, you you, you kind of publish it against uh, some some tag, not unlike what Twitter and other mm -hmm. things do today. And then if you're interested on the receiving side, you subscribe to that. And then uh, there's a question of how well you can make that work at a very low level uh, as the basis for routing and as the basis for, for addressing. Um, that is... Uh, you know, there's some very useful experiments and some some positive results. Whether that will overtake and completely displace uh, our current routing systems and our current domain name uh, uh, domain naming system, uh, I think is quite an open question. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind with the term geo uh, was geolocation. Geolocated, yes. Geolocated. Um, as I say, I, I, it's not a it's not a commonly used term, at least not in my lexicon. But perhaps it also means um, tying things to the actual geographic location. Uh, the, the Internet has grown up with topological routing not tied to geographic boundaries uh, particularly. And so that runs into some um, 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 political issues of uh, some countries say, well, we want to be able to control all the traffic that comes into or out of our country. Um, and that's a whole nother subject. So perhaps mm. that's uh, what he's talking about. But I, so that's, that's the best I can do in mm -hmm. response to the question. Yeah, I guess also give us a little background on, on ICANN. So you're the uh, chair uh, of the ICANN Board of Directors. Uh, what do you do in that capacity? <laughs> um, so uh, John was running this uh, IANA uh, effort, and it got to, it, it, it's what we, call a success disaster. It got, it got uh, bigger and bigger and uh, started to run into uh, uh, potential problems. There were uh, various uh, groups, countries and other groups that started to uh, say, we're going to sue because we don't like uh, what's going on. And John was an employee of the University of Southern California and was being supported by funds coming from the, from the government. And it became evident that it was time to make a, uh, a rather substantial change. Uh, there were uh, very earnest uh, discussions at the highest levels. The White House got involved. And out of that, ICANN got created to be the home of the IANA function and to uh, take on some related issues for the top level of the domain name system. So that was, uh, there were some white paper and green paper and a lot of meetings and so forth. But uh, so ICANN was created in uh, uh, late 1998, and, the, uh, and it was intended that John would be a founding member of that and would act as the chief technology officer. And in one of these very uh, sad and uh, unfortunate situations, John died 
just a few weeks before ICANN was um, brought to life. He died in October 88, and uh, ICANN was formed in, um, uh, I'm sorry, 98. Uh, and ICANN was formed in November uh, 98. Um, so that's the job of ICANN. Um, the IANA part of it has actually been completely straightforward and, and uh, it's getting a lot of attention now for a separate set of reasons. But the part, the, the thing that ICANN has spent a lot of time on is uh, another uh, thing that seemed casual at the time, which was to promote competition and choice. And that included opening up the top-level space, which originally had just been uh, seven top-level domains, com, net, org. Uh, and in fact, it was really, uh, there was gov, gov, and mil for two parts of the U.S. Uh, government. And there was uh, edu for the universities and net for the ISPs and org for the nonprofits and research places, and then this little catch-all com for the few commercial organizations that were part of the network. And then, of course, <laughs> that mushroomed and became you know, hundreds of millions. Um, but it was a very small number. I covered almost all of them in, in what I just said. A very small number of top-level domains, plus the two-letter country Country codes. destination, yeah. And then um, uh, one of the challenges that was... Uh, part of the formation of ICANN was, should the space be opened up? If so, how? And uh, again, there's an awful lot of history. and uh, Yeah. Uh, and just recently, they, they opened up to all different kinds of top-level domains. And that's a very recent A couple thing. of years ago. A couple yeah. of years ago, uh, the application process was opened up. And uh, 1,930 applications came in. Many, some, some were for the same strings. And so there were 1,400-odd yeah. distinct strings. And that's all working its way out. Uh, and again, you get um, all kinds of experiments, uh, some of which are uh, provocative. Um, so what uh, kind of, not really along those lines, but what about the FCC with relation to net neutrality? What do you think about that whole issue? Uh, as little as possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Um, no, I, I, I think net neutrality is an extremely important issue, but it is not an ICANN issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I try to stay clear of it. Um, the uh, ICANN is in the business of overseeing the administration of names and numbers and providing stability and certainty to the way that process works. We have absolutely nothing to do with content. We have absolutely nothing to do with um, uh, routing and uh, provisions of services. That's a uh, job done by ISPs. And hence, we have uh, no, uh, nothing to say about the uh, underlying issues in this network neutrality debate, which have uh, a lot to do with uh, uh, who, who pays what for what level of service and so forth. That's, that's uh, uh, not us. So whatever I might think personally about network neutrality, uh, I'm going to remain quite silent about uh, lest I get in trouble. Mm. Um, and uh, um, that's that. How, how have you seen privacy change as the Internet has evolved? And what are your concerns about privacy today? Well, you know, the, the singular thing that's happened in recent times, of course, is that it's become evident um, how much information can be gleaned uh, from aggressive accumulation of, of data mm -hmm. on the net, uh, both from government activities, and, but also from commercial activities. So there's been a, a very heightened sense of uh, concern. Now, that runs exactly counter to uh, another thing that I think we're all subject to, which is uh, a desire to be well served. Uh, if you walk into your favorite restaurant or uh, a hotel that you visit, and uh, let's say uh, let's say you go to a restaurant, and the waiter shows up with your favorite drink without being asked. Uh, uh, typically, that would mean that you feel that uh, you're known and that you're being taken care of, and you you feel very good about that. But of course, it also means that your habits are are known to somebody other than mm -hmm. yourself, and uh, if it's being used for your benefit and in a, not in an intrusive way, well, then that makes you feel very good. And on the other hand, if those same uh, facts about you are spread about in ways that are deleterious, then you don't feel so good about it. So this business about privacy is a, is a, is a funny sort of two-edged sword with an awful lot of emphasis these days on 
uh, how much control we have of our own footprint. Um, and I think it's just going to take uh, quite a lot of experience to uh, find the right balance. And you have, you have uh, very strong cultural differences and differences ac across countries, even um, differences, say, between the U.S. and, and Britain. Mm -hmm. In Britain, you have an awful lot of surveillance, uh, and it doesn't bother people very much. And uh, whereas here, uh, the sensitivity level is quite different. Absolutely. Um was it April 7th that marked the 46th anniversary of the creation of RF the RFC series? Yes, it was brought to my attention. I'd forgotten, but indeed it was. Excellent, excellent. And there's a, a message that was published um, by the IETF uh, commemorating the anniversary. And they point to RFC 2555, which was written uh, 16 years ago. Um, at the 30th anniversary. It contains some uh, history and reflections, in, including a section from you called The First Pebble. Yep. Um, so when we started the first RFCs, we had no sense of uh, that this was going to be uh, a longstanding thing. Uh, when we got up to RFC 100, uh, after a couple of years, we used that number to uh, publish an index of the previous 99 RFCs and did a little bit of introduction. And I was, frankly, quite surprised. When we got up to RFC 1000, uh, again, was called upon to write some introductory remarks. And I felt like uh, we were looking at a sorcerer's apprentice situation where you couldn't turn it off. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when 30 years came around, RFC uh, 2555, is that the number that yes. you quoted? Yep. Was assembled, and several of us were asked to write a few words. And I wrote the section that you talk about. So that was, uh, that was issued on um, uh, April 7th, 1999, uh, because the first one was in 69. And it was uh, uh, trying to provide a little bit of context for what the, how this came about and what, how, what the culture looked like and how all that worked. Uh, and then Yari Arco, who's the current chair of the Internet Engineering Task Force, wrote the note that you're talking about commemorating the uh, anniversary. Uh, the other thing which... Uh, uh, happened very nicely was I, I got to write a op-ed piece in the New York Times on the 40th anniversary. So six years ago on mm -hmm. April 7th, um, the New York Times was extremely generous and uh, it was like about an 800-word uh, op-ed piece, a happy anniversary RFCs or something like that. Um, and uh, they, they, they treated me quite well. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have any... Final questions for Steve before we get to the five ridiculous questions. No. Okay. So, Steve, now are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Let's have at it. Okay. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, getting old and slow. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Um, talking people to death. <laughs> <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I actually uh, thought about this, and I shocked both of my children uh, in separate conversations uh, that uh, my life has not gone in any way that I planned. And I told them that if I were going to write my autobiography, I would call it Salvage Operation. <laughs> nice. <laughs> In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I, I've never been familiar with that game. How do you play? Uh, it's popular in Europe, so that's probably why we're not familiar with it. Uh, but it involves grabbing people's asses? Um, one, you know, might, one might surmise that. I think yes. we need to write an RFC about <laughs> Ask Grabby Grabby, Steve, because it is, in fact, a fictitious game. So... <laughs> um, uh, one of the pieces of culture about the RFCs is that uh, a tradition developed, not on my watch, but much later, of writing April Fool yes, RFCs. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so every April 1st, there are uh, one or two uh, uh, spoofs that are usually uh, well-constructed yes. uh, uh, and uh, go off in one direction. Um, uh, there was one about IP over carrier pigeons. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. IP over IP one. carrier, For one example. of my favorites. Awesome. Yeah. My other favorite is the evil bit. Yeah. yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll awesome. work on our April Fool's RFC description of Ask Grabby Grabby. <laughs> How's that? Uh, so choose two celebrities to be your parents, Steve. Oh, my goodness. Living or dead? 
Um, you know, I've never ever thought about something like that. It's 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 one of the more difficult questions we ask. We get we tend to get some some awesome answers to it uh, as well. And I always like to stall for time so that the guest has a chance to think about um, it. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to have a very hard time with that, but I'll tell you I'll tell you a couple of things. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I have a lot of familiarity with is uh, the need that children have for stability and um, uh, organization in their lives. Um, and celebrities typically aren't the people that you would want to choose to have <laughs> as parents. It's very uh, true. Yes. Now, there are, there are a few celebrities that do actually have their act together, but... Uh, uh, my first reaction is I'm, I, I might want to choose people who, in fact, are not celebrities. Mm. Well, I, and I do suppose that it, it depends on how you define a celebrity. Yeah. Celebrity example, in your own mind. Yeah, for example, I would define Einstein as a celebrity. Mm. Yeah, well, he'd be one of the people that I would choose not to have as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he's a fantastic guy, and you get to yeah. meet a lot of people, and you might even learn a bunch of mathematics and so forth. But probably not um, a very good parent. But... but whether or not that is the ideal of what you want as a parent, mm. not so sure. sure. Maybe. I mean, I don't know what he was like as a parent. Excellent. Well, maybe, maybe that's another RFC in the makings. I had, uh, I'll tell you, I mean, uh, my parents are special in their way, and I, I don't have any um, uh, heartburn or objections about them. But uh, uh, one, uh, one couple that I want to give some, a shout-out to is I was fortunate enough to do my uh, uh, research work under uh, Professor Gerald Estrin at UCLA. And he and his wife, uh, Thelma Estrin, who were, was also a, a quite renowned researcher, uh, uh, have three daughters who have worked, who've turned out to be quite remarkable in their own right. Uh, Judy Estrin's well-known uh, uh, entrepreneur and and uh, uh, Debbie Estrin, a computer scientist, and the older sister, Margo, is a, a physician. And I would say, from a, watching uh, a family, mm -hmm. uh, that it would be hard to do better. They were stable, they were nurturing, they were warm, uh, and uh, uh, pretty, pretty solid people. And, That's awesome. and now That's they're celebrities. Answer. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, now and now the kids are celebrities as yep. well as yeah. the parents. Yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. That's a great answer, Steve. Steve, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. It was wonderful having you here. Uh, and wish the best of luck. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Steve. With that, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back, um, hopefully get Mr. Santa on the line, Santar Calangelo on the line, uh, to talk about our next segment, Prying Eyes Are Watching You. So make sure you stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> 